Hi, welcome back to my channel. I went to middle school from 2010 to 2013. Jealous? I don't actually mean that. When I see TikToks romanticizing the early 2010s, I want to sit those children down and force them to listen to Train on a Loop. Really all that meant was I saw the entirety of the dystopian YA novel to movie craze. The Hunger Games, Ender's Game, The Giver, The Maze Runner, Divergent, and like all of these movies came out within a five year period. It was the biggest thing in the world, and then it was just gone. Series were cut short and often just ended on a cliffhanger. The biggest dystopian YA novel that never even got a chance on the big screen was Uglies, which came out in 2005, but definitely fits the genre and would be a prime candidate for a movie. But 2015 came and went, and those kinds of movies did worse and worse, so Uglies never even got a chance. Teen Dystopia was a fad and nothing else. Until last year, when A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes did really well, people seemed to like it, and now there will be at least one more Hunger Games movie because of it. And on Friday the 13th, how ominous, Uglies finally got its chance as a feature film on Netflix. Could this be the revival of YA dystopia? Not if Uglies has anything to say about it. Holy shit is this movie bad. Bad enough that it could kill off a renaissance before it even gets started. The movie starts out with Tally Youngblood played by Joey King, explaining that if everyone was pretty, there would be no more wars. Hundreds of years ago, people became overly reliant on fossil fuels. They squandered Earth's natural resources and the planet quickly descended into chaos and war. Everyone on their 16th birthday undergoes a life-changing operation to become their most perfect self. And when everyone is perfect, conflict melts away. And yeah, she's being lied to by the government, but that's still a crazy thing to say. The people in the Hunger Games don't think that society is set up well and that the games are good. It's just the way that things are. And then Tally talks to her friend Paris, another student at the school she goes to. No, I don't even know this place without you. Do you remember when we first hacked the dorms. <laughs> and you made me do my first trick. I didn't make you do anything. Oh yeah, you did. No, I didn't. Oh yes, you did. We learned that in this society, everyone gets an operation done on their 16th birthday to make them beautiful. And the people who have had the operation are called pretties, and the people who haven't are called uglies. But then there are the rest of us awaiting our operation. Until then, we're less than, ignored. People call us, Uglies. This feels like a really elaborate way to call minors pretty and get away with it. Was Drake the president here? All of the uglies also have nicknames based on their most egregious perceived flaw. No matter how beautiful they make yeah. you, the ghost of that giant nose will haunt you forever. Just like I'll always be squint, even when my eyes fit my face. Like Tally is nicknamed Squint because she has a squint. My ugly nickname would have been Four Eyes because when I was 15, I had eyes on my hands like the Pale Man. Obviously none of the pretties wear glasses. Having bad eyesight is both visually unappealing and a moral failure. But none of the uglies wear glasses either, which makes me think that they just kill people who have bad eyesight. Paris's ugly nickname is Nose. Famously a part of the body no one has ever felt insecure about. How are there not 7,000 kids named Nose? And just Nose, you're not going to differentiate it based on what the perceived flaw with the nose is? Hello, I'm editing right now. I did not know that my face started bleeding. I'll play the clip right now. I like rub my nose and then my it starts bleeding. If you don't like looking at blood, it's not like gushing. It just like turns red. Um... <laughs> But I didn't realize that that happened. And of course it happened while I was talking about the character named Nose. Hey buddy, that's how you get the nickname Nose, is when you're making fun of somebody else's nose and your own one starts bleeding, dumbass. There are probably more noses in this world than there are Michaels and Mohammeds in ours. And if everyone else has such vague nicknames, I bet you feel really bad if your nickname is like, cankles. It's very hard to pretend that these two are 15 year olds. They're not. They're adults. Joey King and I are the same age. This is as egregious as when the amazing Spider-Man movies tried to pretend that a 29 year old Andrew Garfield 
was a high school student. It gets even harder to believe when Joey King stands in front of a mirror and says, Mirror, make me pretty. And the mirror shows her this. This society is built around TikTok's bold glamour filter. I barely believe this is what a 15 year old thinks looks pretty, let alone what someone who's voted in multiple elections does. This is also the first thing we see after the title card. So I imagine a bunch of people watched to two minutes into the movie, saw this and were like, no, I'm good. We get to see Paris's graduation ceremony and everyone from the school goes to see the next group of ugly sent out for surgery. All dorms report to Farron Auditorium. The graduation assembly will begin in five minutes. I can't imagine being a teacher so excited to mold young minds at propaganda prep only to find out that every day is assembly day. This must take so much time and be the only bit of indoctrination they can get done and it can't always go well. I am so excited for you to take your place. Penis! Even with the surgery, you'll still be Please. ugly. Before he leaves for surgery, Paris promises Tally that he'll meet with her on this bridge and that he's gonna keep the scar on his hand as a reminder of who he was before he became pretty. The bridge, one month. Don't be like, okay? Deal. <laughs> See you, Scott. Tally tries to get in contact with him after he leaves to no avail. And on the day that they're supposed to meet up, he doesn't show. What? Nose. 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 So Tally goes into the pretty city to try and find him, which is surprisingly easy for being an illegal activity. At the freckles you know. Hello, pretty. And somehow, in this city of millions, she runs into the guy. Quite a few times, and, uh, I mean, it's beautiful. Paris? What are the odds? What are you doing here? Oh, you weren't at the bridge. Yeah, so you, you snuck in? I was worried. You're never late. Yeah, I don't know. Things are just different here. I didn't really know what we'd talk about. I mean, you'll get it when you're pretty. Wow. He sure has changed. Your scar. You promised me. I woke up from surgery and then I realized I just didn't really want it anymore, Tally. Wow, he sure has changed. The movie has decided it's had enough, so somehow Tally is caught. Call me Squint. Yeah. An unwelcome individual has been detected. She escapes with only slightly more difficulty than it took to get into the city. <laughs> and runs into Shay. Get on her, we'll both get caught. Shay's kind of a badass. She hoverboards and reads books. Is that a, a book? You wanna read it? I know propaganda prep only has time for assemblies, but you clearly know what a book is. What else could this be? I also feel like having a character who's a cool rebel who reads books hits different when you're a 14 year old reading a book than when you're a 14 year old watching a movie on Netflix. Shay takes Tally to Rusty Rails, which is not a Fortnite location. I checked. And tells Tally about the smoke. Not like you don't want the smoke, uh, cause they do. They want to go to the smoke. Okay, look, the smoke, it's an alternative, a different way of doing things. Nobody judges you for how you look. It's about who you are on the inside. There are a lot of kids there from all different places. That book you read, it's like that. That's just what they call the area outside the city where there's a community of people who don't get the surgery. The other reason Shay is important is because Shay and Tally have crazy romantic chemistry. Hey, boyfriend, uh, best friend. I'm so sick of feeling like I'm less than. But you're not. I want people to see me. I see you. Hey, focus. Lean into it. What color eyes do you want, Shay? I, I don't know. They will betray that, don't worry. But these two are definitely more than just friends. Shay, you're my friend, I promise. See, usually movies will put a line like that in to tell people about a relationship that they haven't developed on screen. But here it's the opposite. It's to go, these two are just friends. I promise that they are strictly platonic. They also share a birthday. Wait, September 9th. <laughs> no way. 
We have the same birthday. Which means that they will be called in for surgery on the same day. What is that? Flint and steel. Bang them together, they spark. This is actually a deleted scene from the Minecraft movie that they snuck into this one. David. What? He's real, Tally. The smoke is real, and he'll be here any minute. Are you kidding me? Shay tells Tally all this because she's going to go to the smoke on their 16th birthday instead of getting the surgery, and she wants Tally to come too. Shay, I just think that you're afraid to grow up. I'm afraid to stop growing. I want you to come with me. It's finally Tally's birthday and Shay's, and after the ceremony, she's never called in to get her surgery. Instead, Dr. Cable, clearly a good person, Dr. Cable comes out and tells her that she needs to find Shay or she will not be allowed to become a pretty. Help us. The sooner you do, the sooner we can get to your procedure. Kind of crazy to make the evil person who does evil surgeries a trans woman. What is it, Joe Brand is America? Luckily, Shay gave Tally directions to find the smoke in case she did want to come. But there's a little bit of a twist. I wrote directions in a code only you'll understand. Ah, a secret code. I can only imagine what sorts of riddles Tally will have to solve in order to find the, the coaster straight past the gap until you find one that's long and flat. <sighs> <laughs> Oh, it's just a series of very convenient limericks. Tally doesn't even solve most of them. She just keeps going forward and then is like, oh, that line makes sense for what I just did. Cool. Find the wall and weigh the face. Don't look down and do not haste. <laughs> Your journey ends in a sea of white. The smoke will find you in the night. In a code only you'll understand. You think anyone would come across this field of white flowers and be like, hmm, well, I'm looking for a sea of white, but I don't see any water here, so this can't be it. Tally makes it to the smoke and the romantic tension with Shay continues. Is it what you pictured? Um, not at all, actually. History will say they were just friends. Tally meets David, who everyone back at Propaganda Prep thinks is just a myth, but he's real. Look, he's standing there. And he shows her the ropes and tells her all about what the smoke stands for. The city is not going to stop because the smoke is a threat to everything they stand for. They make us feel so alone and so insecure that we don't have time for things that actually matter. Thinking, reading, learning, Dreaming. She eventually meets David's parents who founded the smoke and they reveal that the surgery is not just cosmetic. That's when I first noticed this pattern of lesions in the brain. These lesions in the frontal cortex, they dull you. You don't care about anything. You can't think clearly. You're sedated into a false sense of happiness. When we realized that, Cable showed up, told us to stop digging and took all our research. That's when we knew the lesions were not a side effect of the surgery, they were the purpose. They had been working on a cure, but when Dr. Cable took over, they were ran out of town, which is why they founded the smoke. Can you cure the lesions? We're close, but there's still that synthetic component we just don't have out here. I think this is the movie's big statement on beauty beyond it's what's on the inside that counts. They dull you. You don't care about anything. You can't think clearly. You're sedated into a false sense of happiness. The book is 20 years old, so it's probably too young to be cast in the movie. And social media has radically changed how young people view themselves and their peers over the last two decades. I'm not saying I want all the pretties to have Instagram accounts with way more followers than the uglies. Like it's clear that they chose this as representative of what's beautiful because it looks like a filter. Is the movie trying to say that people who use Instagram filters are brainwashed? Obviously those filters are tailored around a specific Eurocentric beauty standard. And that's bad, but everyone in this movie always looks 
picture perfect. When they're disheveled, they're beautifully disheveled. Truly, what's the difference between the full glam of mirror tally and the normal glam of ugly tally? Tally and David have a conversation around a campfire that sounds eerily like a One Direction song. I've just done so many bad things. I've just done in all the wrong ways. It makes me feel like maybe I am just ugly. No. What you do, the way you think, makes you beautiful. And then they kiss? Remember earlier when Tally said, we're just friends? Yeah, you're my friend, I promise. I feel like they needed to give David a line here where he's like, Tally, we flirted a lot. Just to show that there's been some sort of romantic tension here, because it... It really feels like it's all between Tally and Shay. Then Shay throws the necklace Dr. Cable gave her into a fire, which tells Dr. Cable where the smoke is. Dr. Cable and her soldiers descend on the smoke, and all of the fights look very cool. And one of Dr. Cable's soldiers is Paris. <laughs> Wow, he sure has changed. They kill one of David's parents. They kidnap basically everyone else. They destroy the smoke, but David and Tally are all able to get away. Let her go. Let her go. This movie needs a third act. And boy, does that third act fly by. Everything that happens from here on happens in the last 15 minutes of the movie. Tally and David head straight to the hospital, the capital, wherever it is they do the surgery and free everyone who was just captured. There's like a single guard they evade and a second guard who they subdue. And that is all the security for this building. <laughs> they free everyone except Shay, who has already undergone her transformation. Tally. They trick Dr. Cable into bringing them to the surgery room. Steal the things they need for the cure, escape with Shay, and make it to the roof where they're confronted by Paris in his Tron suit. No, no, Tally, wait. No, 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 let me talk to him, please. No. Paris gets a new scar that matches his old scar. This is definitely part of the remembering who he was arc that he's going to go on in the sequel, if we get there. The fight ends when they push him off the roof and into this waterfall. He's definitely not dead. Again, he's got to be there for the sequel for his redemption arc. They escape to the ruins of the old city where David's mom does not give Shay the cure. Honey, we are not going to perform medical experiments on an unwilling subject. That's the difference between us and them. So Tally says, I'll be the one to get the surgery so I can test the cure. I'll do it. What? I'll be your test subject. And she gets captured by Dr. Cable and taken back to the city. I'm Tally Youngblood! Make me pretty! I don't know how she plans on getting around having lesions in her brain that brainwash you. Uh, probably just through sheer force of will. There are people who have second thoughts about the surgery after getting it. So it's not impossible to find willing subjects for this. It's also not impossible that Tally gets the surgery and is not fully brainwashed, but they don't know that. <laughs> it's possible that she gets the surgery and is like, being a pretty is kind of great. I love this. I think that we should destroy the smoke and all the uglies. We see her wake up post-op, filter in full effect, but she still has the scar on her hand, which means she's not a full pretty. If the message of this movie is supposed to be true beauty is on the inside. What you do, the way you think, makes you beautiful. Then why end the movie with the protagonist in full glam? That's right, this is the final shot of the movie. Stop. Obviously, they're hoping for a sequel, but I don't know if they're going to get it. That's a bold aspiration for any movie in this genre, even bolder because it's a Netflix movie. 
You know the company that's always canceling sequels? I think it's easy to look at this movie and go, uglies? But then why are all the actors pretty? And that's like kind of the point of the movie? The surgery isn't supposed to make these people pretty. It's supposed to make them conform to the futuristic beauty standard, which I think works better in a book where you can just describe the process and the people imagine it in their own heads versus a movie where if you show the pretties and they don't then look pretty, then people are going to go, but that's not. So then why does everybody think that? I can't see this getting a sequel. And while the Hunger Games will get new movies, they've already made all the books into film. So those will just be movies based on the characters from those books. This really feels like a nail in the coffin for new YA dystopia. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did and you wouldn't mind leaving a like or subscribing, I'd really appreciate that. I've been watching a lot of the Talk To A podcast, so expect a video on that by the end of the month or my letter of resignation. Again, thank you so much for watching and hopefully I'll see you in the next one. I, oh, I, I can't. I can't do the bye-bye with my hands in my glasses. I'm Davy.